the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, how Japan made its first modern MBT, squad mates, sightseeing on the Korean peninsula, and metal beasts, jaguar in the Indian jungle. The spring update of 2024 is just around the corner, and soon we'll be featuring the new vehicles it brings. But for now, we have a chance to fly the main reward of the Sword of Justice event that many of you have already scored for your hangers. The name of this reward is the Jaguar IS. This Indian version is the fifth modification of the famous British-French fighter bomber family. It's almost identical to all the models we already know, but we can still say it's the most modern and advanced one. Why? Let's check it out together. First, this aircraft has better engines even compared to the best British version. Its total afterburning power exceeds 7,000 kilogram forces. Meanwhile, its mass is almost the same. Naturally, the fresh thrust-to-weight ratio offers improved acceleration and climb rates, but don't rush into a turn fight just yet. At its BR, the Indian Jaguar can meet a lot of pure fighters capable of reducing it into a regular bomber without the fighter part in front. Try to avoid close quarter combat unless absolutely necessary. Yes, this aircraft can turn really well in the first few maneuvers, but it can quickly lose speed and become a helpless target. Don't think you should avoid air battles altogether, though. This Jaguar is the new lowest BR carrier of jam-resistant air-to-air missiles in War Thunder. Here they are. Look at those unique over-wing hardpoints. If you launch the magic missiles at close range, you can get two easy frags in pretty much every fight. The plane also comes with countermeasures for enemy missiles. The pool totals 60 units, which isn't too generous, but enough for a battle if used sparingly. The forward-firing armament packs less of a punch compared to other models. It only features a single 30mm cannon with 150 rounds of ammo. Of course, it can still hit and damage enemies, but fire density is much lower. There was a reason for this sacrifice, though. The second cannon was replaced with a targeting pod. It makes ground strikes much easier and, more importantly, keeps all the hardpoints free. That's why the Indian modification can carry not two, but three laser-guided bombs. The total payload breaks no records, sure, but with this kind of caliber, you can sometimes hit multiple targets in a single drop. If you want even more, you can add two conventional bombs to the external hardpoints, which shouldn't be too hard to use with a ballistic computer. The Indian Jaguar combines all the best from previous models and is now ready to become the new versatile fighter in high-ranking battles. In 1975, the Japan Self-Defense Force adopted the Type 74 tank. Despite offering some advantages like a hydro-pneumatic suspension, the new MBT had a vague future. The leading military powers were already developing vehicles with composite armor and larger calibers. That's why Japan got down to developing a future tank right after launching the Type 74 into production. They wanted to enhance the new tank with all the experience they received in the last decade. A few weapons companies offered their 120 and 135mm cannons for the project. The tank was also expected to receive composite armor from the start, while later prototypes were even made modular. The first version of the turret was somewhat similar to its predecessor, the Type 74, but the engineers soon switched to a more square shape, like on the Leopard 2. The Japanese also completed their own autoloader mechanism and added it to the new tank. It was originally planned for the Type 61, then for the Type 74, but for one reason or another, the idea was abandoned during the preparation stages. The autoloader's ammo racks were placed in the turret rear, protected by blowout panels. The future MBT was also equipped with the latest technologies, a laser warning receiver, thermal vision devices, and an automatic fire control system. The new tank was designated the Type 90. Despite looking similar to the German Leopard 2, 
it was designed and built entirely by domestic effort. The only exception is the main caliber. The machine turned out pretty expensive, so the military opted for the German tried-and-true RH-120 cannon over local offers. Mass production began in 1990 and continued for almost 20 years. The military-industrial complex averaged 19 units per year. This high-tech, advanced, made-to-order Japanese tank managed to bring quite a heap of issues. Developing military vehicles, Mitsubishi usually kept in mind the capacities of bridges in Japan. The Type 61 and the Type 74 had masses below 40 tons, while the Type 90 reached all of 50. This created all sorts of logistical problems, while its size made its use in tight urban areas of Japan problematic. Local production also cost a pretty penny, an issue more pronounced with the end of the Cold War. The original plan was to make almost a thousand of these tanks, but ultimately only 350 or so were made. The Japan Self-Defense Force still has the Type 90 in service, but the tank has received no major upgrades since the 90s, unless we count mine roller mounts. The tank's base was used for a few auxiliary vehicles, but the platform was deemed too expensive to become widespread. Nowadays, the industry is busy making a new MBT, called the Type 10. It has a lower mass and size and is armed with a locally produced cannon. But that's a story for another time. The squad mates toured quite a number of cold and frosty locations last winter. Time to travel somewhere warmer. How about East Asia? Today, we'd like to show you key firing lines and useful positions on the Korean Peninsula, in a location known as the 38th Parallel. The central part of the map is very similar for both teams, so the tactics we're about to showcase are suitable for both sides of the battle. In Scenario 1, both players stay together during the entire session. Spawn on the west side of the map and take the nearest road to the river island. Split up right after the bridge. One of you should turn right and climb the hill, while the other one should move along the edge of the village and climb next to point A. Your main goal at this stage is to clear the elevated area and take it under your control. To do this, attack from two sides at once and gradually take the circle road, helping each other when necessary. Once this task is complete, one of you can go back to the village and take point A, unless your allies have already done that. The next goal is the center of the map. Circle the hill and move towards point B. Stay alert and pay attention to your surroundings. Having two viewpoints at the same time makes spotting hostiles faster and more reliable. Once you see a target, coordinate your attacks. Once the center is clear, drive down to the capture area in turns and take it to help your team gain a score advantage as fast as possible. This is where we could have stopped, but our squad decided to strengthen its positions even more and headed east, towards the dam. One of the tanks moves along the river, using the bank as cover, while the other one picks a simpler path along the road south of the river. This kind of parallel movement allows for better environmental awareness, which in turn shortens your reaction time and speeds up attacks. After a short skirmish, the third point is taken too. Scenario 2 starts with spawning at different points. One of you should take the already familiar road towards the bridge and turn right towards point B before reaching the elevated area. The other one can drive down to the center following the roads between the rice fields while also checking the opposite bank of the river. There's a good chance of hitting an enemy vehicle there. Once both players are close to the point, you can commence the attack. Envelop the area on opposite sides and use crossfire to handle any opponent you encounter. Well, now it's time for the second point. We've already discussed the dam area, so this time we're choosing the western direction. Use the same circle road to go around the elevated area on opposite sides and move to the village, flanking point A. Having the high ground will help you spot and hit enemies who could also be busy fighting your allies at that time. Once this point is clear and capped, you can stay on the island and find good defensive positions. Tell us in the comments what maps you'd like to see next. Meanwhile, we'll answer some of the questions you asked us in previous episodes.
The first question was sent by a player called Ryan Rothermel. How do I use the AGM-65 missile? I bought the A-10 and have no clue how to use it. Hi, Ryan. That's not as hard as it seems. The Maverick has a TV homing device, so you need to find and lock onto a target first. Next, you just launch the missile, and it does the rest on its own. You can assign the keys to control it all in controls, aircraft, weapon. Mr. Viggy asks, Ah, yes, the Gripen. My dad has had some history with this type. He was one of the few that flew the special painted green Gripen, or 39131. Can't wait to get the Gripen. Hello, Mr. Viggy. We wish you a nice flight. By the way, that green camo's available on Live War Thunder. Another question comes from Rodolfo Hernandez. How do you activate automatic countermeasures on jets? Hey, Rodolfo. Just assign a key for periodic countermeasures release and set up the intervals before you join a battle. Jeremy Clarkson writes, Please tell me, when will you get your content creator link? I want to get a snail decal and 3% off the Gaijin store using a link for the War Thunder official channel. Good afternoon, Mr. Clarkson. We've created our referral program for creators who make content about War Thunder. It would be weird to post one on our official page, wouldn't it? Besides, there are so many amazing content makers out there. Check them out. We're sure you'll find a favorite and they'll be happy to get your support. And the last comment for today was written by Anonymous British. I just realized that 10 years ago in War Thunder, the first tanks were released. Hey, you're right. The open beta test of ground vehicles in War Thunder happened 10 years ago. Does anyone remember what vehicles came first? The first maps? Tell us in the comments. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Rage by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget that reminiscing about the glorious past is a sign of age, not the times. Leave a like. Share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.